Paul's Show, a podcast in collaboration with Eli Productions and Oddball Magazine. Greetings, all you artists, aliens, and anarchists. This is indeed the Oddball Show. My name is Prof, and I represent the hip hop side, the JP Lime side of this unbalanced equation. Uh, of course, there could be no oddball show without the original oddball himself, uh, with not a jagged edge, but jagged thoughts. The founder and editor in chief of Oddball Magazine. Please say hello to Mr. Jason Wright. Hey, what's up, everybody? Oh, uh, what's going on, man? Hey, what's up, bro? Hey, dude. Um, so, uh, we're just uh, introducing everybody. So, uh, um, Welcome to the Oddball Show. This is going to be an awesome show tonight. We, we have a, a great guest. We have two great guests on the show. Um, a fan of uh, trauma films. You're going to love this, uh, this episode. So, uh, without uh, further ado, Ralph. Yes. So um, also joining us tonight, uh, we are fortunate to be joined by my, part, my partner in Lime, the creative eye behind 1981 and Co., an exciting new photography and visual art enterprise that you can learn all about at jplineproductions.com. He's uh, vicious on the mic, and he's known as Automatic Slim behind an AK. <laughs> Please welcome the one, the app call spaceman, Mr. Colgan Johnson. Hey, what's up, folks? I'm so humbled by that uh, introduction. Uh, you all are amazing. Thanks for having me, and I can't wait to talk about this stuff. Absolutely. Well, thanks for being here, brother. Hey, you want to do me a favor? We, uh, we're all on icons, so will you switch yeah. over to your uh, your icon real quick there? Yeah. I'll do that real quick. Thanks, man. Um, but yeah, thanks for joining us, man. It's really uh, it's going to be cool to to have you and uh, our guest on together to talk a little bit about your, your movie foray. This is such an awesome show. I'm, I'm so pumped. Okay, go ahead. It's that uh, red tea. <laughs> it's the red tea. <laughs> Get you going. Get you going. Um, our guest this evening is an artist whose brush and canvas are spurting blood, boundary-breaking gore, and a keen camera lens. He's the founder and driving force between behind Ungovernable Films and the now-defunct Bloody Hammer Films, whose catalog includes Moon Smilers, Nursing Home of Death, and the feature film Honky Holocaust. He's a taste of something retro for you modern-day cretins, and we are very pleased to have him on the podcast. The Mad Scientist, a man for whom nothing is sacred, Please give a warm oddball show welcome to Mr. Paul McElarney. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yo, what's up, guys? Hey, did you write? Who wrote that? Who wrote what? The introduction. I did. That's that 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 is uh I might have to bring you around with me from now on whenever I enter a room. <laughs> <laughs> I'll take that gig. That sounds like a good one for me. <laughs> yeah, it was very flattering. And uh, um, yeah, it was really cool. Well, like hey, we're very glad to have you on the show. Thanks for taking the time. Uh, and we, you certainly occupy a very interesting artistic space that we are, we're eager to explore tonight. So thanks, for, thanks for being here. Hey, thanks for having me. Michelle, come on. Jason, what'd you say? We have a trauma film, trauma film director on the show. This is nuts. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay. So you just mentioned trauma films. That is the distribution company that um, that uh, your ungovernable films is hooked up with. Let's get right into talking about um, uh, the background of ungovernable films and what it is that you 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 see as your um, your your motto or what it is that you're trying to do with, with ungovernable films. So. Um I don't know. I mean, uh, first and foremost, uh, I love movies. I like making movies. Uh, and I've always liked writing. Like when I was like really, really young, I mean, I'm talking like two years old, I was already making books, but I wasn't, I couldn't even write a word yet. I was just drawing. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I was avid about telling stories. So fast forward 20 years, 25 years, whatever. And I had all these screenplays I'd written. Um, and nobody, nobody really wanted to produce them, obviously, because who wants to produce some some other person's uh, screenplay? So I said, all right, well, you know what? Then I guess I'll have to do it myself. Um, so that's how I got into filmmaking. And then how I got into this style of filmmaking is, uh, I don't know. I've just, I've always, I've always been a very uh, stubborn, defiant, um, a little bit angry at the world kind of person. So. 
I wanted to do something that was going to break down barriers and, you know, smash mm -hmm. systems and all that good stuff. But you definitely do in, uh, in uh, the movies that I, I, I've watched so far. I've, I, uh, well, I started watching uh, uh, um, Ungovernable Force, which is a, a tour de force of uh, awesome uh, punk uh, amazingness. Um, uh, so uh, can you tell me a little bit about um, the Ungovernable uh, films, like philosophy a little bit? And, and you know, maybe Ungovernable Force and like, are they related at all or? Yeah, um, the, I mean, can I swear on this podcast? Fuck, no. All right, cool. <laughs> Absolutely. This is the All internet. Right, cool. We can do whatever we want. Fuck yeah. All right, so our uh, our motto for some time, and still to this day, we just, just kind of gotten a little bit old, uh, was fuck CGI. Um, like, we don't like using any CGI uh, to the point where, I mean, we I mean, we use Photoshop or some of our graphics, but nothing, nothing moving, no motion. No, no computer generated motion at all. Um, and so, and the reason is, I mean, we just want to, you know, pay homage to, you know, the Russ Myers of the world and the Ro Roger Corman, even though Roger Corman uses CGI, you know, like crazy now. And even Lloyd Coffin does, but anyway, we just, you know, we wanted to, to do things raw and gritty and real. Uh, and we felt like CGI was, you know, you can't, you don't get covered in, and, and and sticky gross fake blood when you're using cgi blood you know what i'm saying right right um so we want yeah, you know, we want everything to be gritty and dirty and, and back to its roots and um yeah i mean we're not we're not against anyone that does uh films that we that we wouldn't necessarily necessarily want to do but if it's if i'm gonna go out you know spend thousands of dollars and you know spend you know hundreds and hundreds of hours and you know probably lose years off my life from stress and uh, lose hair eventually, then uh, uh, I, I want to be doing a film that, that I really enjoy doing, which is going to definitely be something exploitative. And you say, um, you say we, uh, who else is it that is the, you know, the, your, co your collaborators and or the driving force behind uh, uh, ungovernable films? So it's myself. Um, and then I brought with me from Bloody Hammer. We, we, we kind of dissolved Bloody Hammer because there was a few, you know, there, there was some uh, personality differences, I would say. And it just wasn't working out in the end. Also, like, difference of opinions on, on where to go with the company. Um, so we, we amicably split up, uh, and I started Ungovernable Films. And I brought with me from Buddy Hammer, uh, Nick Norman, who, I mean, to this day, I haven't made a single film without Nick. He's always been my cameraman, my uh, director of photography, and also I just bounce ideas off of him. Usually I'll have, like, a half-baked idea, and he'll finish making it he'll like for instance uh in the ungovernable force um there's monsters uh, which i know you haven't gotten to that part yet mm -hmm. uh, yep i just like <laughs> we got into um, the, the love story of and then uh, the uh, the uh, the oozing in the bathtub and uh, yes so the, <laughs> and near the end there's uh monsters those monsters would never have been there if it wasn't for nick you know i had this this cool idea about punks and bums and and cops fighting each other mm. and uh and then he said, well, you know, I think it needs monsters. So that's that. I mean, Nick is a genius uh, cinematographer, but he also adds a little bit of the, you know, the weirdness to the films we do. Um, so that's Nick. Um, then there's uh, Dave Sullivan. Dave Sullivan is, you know, he's a uh, he's like a Su Somerville townie. <laughs> <laughs> um, and he and I just, you know, we just. We, we see eye to eye on a lot of stuff, especially uh, artistic direction. Um, he and I are both, you know, we both uh, are recovering addicts and have mental health issues. And we also have a huge, a really strong work ethic, uh, both of us, I'd say. So we connected on that level. Uh, and we also both love exploitation films, kung fu movies, horror movies, trauma. Um, we, we're also both, you know, from he's from like the 90s hardcore scene and I'm from like the early 2000s like uh, punk and hardcore scene. Uh, those are our backgrounds. And um, so we connected on that. And, and he's been like my right-hand man with a lot of like the casting stuff, location scouting, et cetera. And then there's my boy, Alex. And Alex is, uh, he is, if he, he, he's the last person you'd expect to be part of uh, Ungovernable Films. Alex is from like inner, inner, inner city, like, they get, like the, the hood uh, in Dorchester. Um, 
and he showed up to audition for Honky Holocaust, and we just hit it off. Um, he doesn't really like B movies, exploitation movies, horror movies, even. Uh, he doesn't get that we do this and we don't care if we make any money. He's a businessman at heart. Um, he doesn't, you know, like we do a lot of stuff that uh, he's uh, he's by no means. I would never say he's homophobic or anything, but you know, when we are doing weird stuff, you know, castrating he, and uh, and yeah, <laughs> and we're mixing doing, milkshakes with penises and exactly, and, exactly. When we're doing weird sexual stuff that you know isn't. Is what he would, you know, I, I think of doing on a on a fun Saturday night. He's always like, uh, what? He always says like, he has this phrase. Whenever he's with us, he has to prepare to party with his white friends. Because <laughs> <laughs> he, he always says, I never know what kind of gay shit I'm going to get into if I talk, when, I, when I hang out with you guys. <laughs> um, so yeah, and that's Alex. But he's a huge asset. He's uh, he he kind of keeps our head on straight a lot of the times because he's definitely like the most you know, business oriented, uh, clear thinker of all of us. Um, he, but he's also just, I mean, he's such a team player. Uh, he's found us so many locations. He's opened up several of his houses to us. Um, he's a real estate agent. He's also a very successful real estate agent and owns several houses. So he actually opens up his houses to us for locations and has all these great connections that we've taken advantage of. And He's just along for the ride. I don't think he understands why he's along for the ride, but he's along for the ride. That was to be my question: is is why why is he in uh, involved with you guys? But I don't, I don't know. know. I, mean, <laughs> I, audit, I think it's one hundred percent sentimental. I mean, there's there's times when Alex will say, uh, you know, I think we're gonna make it one day. I think we're gonna be big. And I mean, he could be right. We might be like the na- the, the next James Gunn, you know, and go from trauma films to Guardians of the Galaxy. Yeah. Do, I, do I think it's going to happen? Probably not, just by by by, by chance. I mean, the, the odds of that are very low, but I would never write it off. You know what I mean? I'm not going to say, oh, we'll never get there and then not try. Um, so, I mean, sometimes he'll talk about that. Other times he'll just shake his head when he sees us literally blowing money that we could be, um, you know, putting towards something financially profitable. And he just doesn't get why we need to buy you know, more mannequins to, to blow up or something when we could be, you know, <laughs> so he's, you know, no, seriously, I need, I need 10 mannequins for the scene. They need all, all we could be paying for a, a cool location. We could be, uh, we could be making t-shirts and shit. So, Paul, so I know what trauma is. Um, okay. I figured this might be just, maybe we should tell our listeners because not everybody knows what trauma films are. True. Uh, can we can we do a little bit? Uh, just talk talk about trauma films, uh, the Toxic Avenger, Sergeant Kabuki yeah. Man. You know what is trauma? Um, so trauma was founded by Lloyd Kaufman and uh, Michael Hertz. Um, I think they both went to Yale. I know Lloyd Kaufman went to Yale, and I think that he met Michael Hertz at Yale. Um, and they actually Lloyd Kaufman was actually. Uh, one of the producers, he wasn't one of the head producers, but I think he was like an associate producer, a line producer or something, um, and a location scout on uh, Rocky, Sylvester oh. Stallone's movie. Oh, wow. And he he actually is in a scene, and I it might have been a deleted scene, or he just wasn't credited. He's a drunk that, that Sylvester Stallone throws out of a bar at one point. Yeah. Gently throws out of the. <laughs> I mean, that's. I mean, that that would be Lloyd Kaufman's uh, role in a mainstream film is as the drunk that gets thrown out of a bar. Yeah. But anyway, after Rocky, he decided. And again, this is all what I've read. He never told me this this story. But um, after Rocky, he decided that uh, he hated big studio films. He hated mainstream Hollywood stuff. And so he. Um, he was like, all right, well, I'm just going to do my own thing. Indie films, you know, almost, you know, very low budget, uh, fun, et cetera. And so he started Troma with Michael Hertz. And they started off by doing like these kind of like goofy screwball sex comedies. Um, uh, there's like one called Stuck on You. Uh, I have that one on VHS. It's pretty good. And then there's The First Turn On is another early one. I haven't seen that one, but I, it's on my list of movies to see. Uh, and then, like, they kind of just, like, moseyed along doing these, you know, screwball sex comedies. And then they did the Toxic Avenger, which mm. which really pushed them into a whole new genre uh, and, like, made them not household names, but 
you know, pretty close to it. And um, they had like a cart, like a, a Saturday morning kids cartoon came out for Toxic Avenger. They had uh, merchandise. Oh, my oh hell yeah! <laughs> oh man, yeah. So that's trauma, and they're still around. They're, I think they are the longest, the longest, um, you know, the, the oldest or the, the longest running independent uh, studio, film studio in the United States and maybe the world. I'm not sure about that. And they're they're funny films. They're funny films. They push the envelope. They're they're cool. Their their eighties movies are wicked awesome. Like, yeah, absolutely. Like, uh, I I mean I grew up watching trauma films. Um, yep. Uh, so I mean you grew up watching trauma films, so it must be yeah, kind of yeah. crazy to be like the like the new like a new part of trauma or like you know moving trauma forward to the mainstream. It is really cool. It is it's it's really cool. Um, and it's a great experience. And uh, what was I going to say? The, the 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 weird thing about Trauma is they actually they release tons and tons of movies. Like they've only produced I don't know a, a dozen or, or two dozen or so films, but they release like hundreds, if not. I mean, don't quote me on this, but it seems like thousands sometimes. <laughs> um, like their list of movies is just endless. Yo, can I say something real quick? Yeah. Uh, but um. So when I was um back on the set of Honky Holocaust, like the movie was no doubt weird and bugged out, right? <laughs> yeah. Like like super trippy. And before I even get into that, let me say, yo, Paul, it's great to hear you. You too, man. Um, I didn't get to say hello. What's up, up Cole? Yo, you sound amazing. So hope all is well with you. Thank you, man. Um, Likewise. But like, uh, and this is gonna be about you. So, yo, the the ability this man has to like bring crazy, like freaky concepts. But then, like, bring them down to people, and then like put them on on film, like, so I can only it's it's wild. But you have a great ability, man, to translate some wild stuff like the human language, and then to film. Like, I can't. I hope I get that across, man. Like the way, like the crowd and the because the set was wild. But like, you got a great rapport with people, man. Like, I had so much fun on that set and learned so much. It was just dope. So keep doing it, homie. Thank you, Cole, and that means a lot. And, and- I know exactly what you're talking about. Uh, it, it is. It's uh, it's important to have to be able to make weird concepts relatable. Well, let's get let's get right into this. Let's use. Prof, I think you unmiked yourself. <laughs> oh, <laughs> I don't, how did you, how did you know that I was talking right then? That's that's crazy. <laughs> uh, let's use this as a good segue to hop into. Um, Honky Holocaust, because uh, one of the the things that I noted about it when I was watching is that it's not just a horror exploitation movie. There's a really deep and interesting concept at its heart. And so I imagine, I don't know, imagine bridging that that line is uh, is kind of a, a interesting path to walk and is a unique path to walk. Do you find that there are other filmmakers who use that kind of combination of social commentary and exploitation? And, um, I don't know. They'll start there. <laughs> um, yeah. I mean, right off the bat, uh, trauma does. Um, I, I don't think that they're quite as, I, I have trouble. I have a lot of trouble. Uh, um, what's the word? Not, not being wordy or not being in your face with, with concepts sometimes. Um, at trauma is a lot. I feel like they're better at integrating with the message and making it a little bit more subtle. All right, that's the problem. I have I have trouble with subtlety. I'll say right there. That's what I'm trying to say. <laughs> so I mean, I know that scene. My films can kind of tell. <laughs> if in fact, if you saw if you if you saw how many deleted scenes there were just from the script and also just in the films, like scenes we actually shot that I had to take out because it just says the same message over and over. You'd see. I, that's my biggest flaw is I cannot do subtlety. So, too many, too many Kendra monologues where she just yeah, yeah. exactly. You, know, you have no idea. Like there's, <laughs> scene, there's scenes that were taken out of uh, Honky Holocaust um, that are just just Kendra monologues um, or someone else's monologue. But uh, I'm a writer at heart. I mean, so I, I, I can't help it. But um, so I would say, yeah, the, the like trauma especially is doing it. And then there's like you know, there's a lot. I've seen a lot of exploitation films, modern and old, that that do touch on social issues. Um, but I, I mean, I like to think that ours is are, are unique in, in one way or another, uh, definitely with the lack of subtlety, uh, you know, for better and worse, but, um, yeah, does that answer your question? 
Yeah, I mean, yeah, it does. Well, I mean, and, and and more. My bigger question was, I don't know if it's if it is, if that combination is a, a specific thing. Because I mean, it is a, like a an odd thing for your genre. Because I don't know exploitation films as well, but I think you do it. You blend them very well. Like, so let's let's talk a little bit about what Holocaust is for our listeners who don't know. Okay. Uh, there is uh, the the Manson family has gone underground uh, after. Charlie's death is that the, is he is he dead at the beginning? He's alive in the beginning, um, and he comes he goes underground to like their underground bunker uh, with the family, but then he dies while he's underground. That's right. So, that's right. So then there's a, there's a, there's a race war that goes on while they're underground, and uh, black folk rise up, and it's uh, similar to I don't know White Man's Burden with uh, John DeVolta, where it's just kind of a uh, paradigm shift where what would, what would happen if black folk were in control and would it be different and uh, uh, I don't know would would it be equally as oppressive and in this case it totally is uh, and then there's a whole bunch of action and, and uh, death and uh, war and uh, I think it's it it's a really I've never seen a film like it I'll tell you that cool I, I appreciate that I've never seen uh, white man's burden but I, I heard of it shortly after we started shooting um so i was like oh i think it's a john travolta movie like this i was like oh okay cool (laughs) (laughs) colgan how did how did it end up that you were um hooked up with honky holocaust me oh what a bugged out story all right so honestly i think this is one of those times so i just wanted to get back into acting this is after i graduated college and i was like man i really wanted something creative and I think uh, you guys posted on Craigslist. Yep. And I was like, this sounds pretty interesting. So I was like, let me just go to the uh, the casting call. So I drove to the casting call, uh, auditioned, and I got the part. And um, yeah, man, the set was cool. Uh, let me, you got any more questions? It was just, it was a crazy experience, dude. Like, crazy. Well, well, well I mean, I, I, uh, in one of Paul's films, Kogan. Huh? What's it like acting in one of uh, Paul's films? Oh, so as an actor, um, it's honestly really great. Um, like I, I mentioned it before, but Paul has a really good job, a really good way of explaining things. So you feel like you can explore, but you don't feel like um, like belittled or like you can't have that room to create. And like there's, there, there's of course, time limits with film, but he's still able to like let that adventure roam. But he explains things well, like instructions are so crucial. But he's like, maybe it's just his personality too. Like, Paul just has like this, uh, and I mean this in the best like way, because I think all great creators have it, like like a kid-like quality. Like, it's just mad fun, right? But when it's time to get to work, like, you know it's about to go down. So the energy is dope. Like, the energy was just, like, crazy. It was kind of like making music or, like, making some funny art. I don't know. Like, it was just, it was like crazy energy. People were always just bouncing, and you wanted to do it because it was fun. Hell yeah. And, and Paul, what's it like, um, like, directing people and telling them what to do um i don't know for me it's kind of natural uh i i i'm the oldest of four and i mean me too yeah oh for real we have uh we have videos like home movies of me directing my siblings in like peter pan reenactments uh when we were like five years old so like I mean, it just it just comes naturally to me. I guess I don't know. I mean, I'm not, I'm not like I don't mean to I don't mean to sound like I'm bragging. It just it just I don't know. It's just like second nature. You know what I mean? It's what you yeah. were meant to do. You feel like I guess so. Yeah. Um, I just I know what needs to get done. I I I really enjoy people. Like I like meeting people, getting to know people, uh, being around people, and then but most of all, I like to see what groups of people are able to do together. And I don't have I don't have a problem, uh, you know, again, for better and worse, identifying the goal and then, you know, and then having the philosophy of the end justifies the means. So, like, we, I mean, we've been on sets before where people have gotten hurt. We've got been on sets that went really, really late. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, the food is terrible usually. <laughs> like, they're not – I mean, Colgan is right. They are a lot of fun. Um, but at the same time, they're, they're by no means a luxurious – uh totally safe environment i mean we do a lot of 
That's wild <laughs> shit. <laughs> we were definitely grunged out. I think the cops came a couple times. We got to talk did. to. They did, yeah. The cops came with their guns drawn one time. Remember that in, in Malden? Oh yeah. yeah. I always remember that. <laughs> but um, you know, I think the cool part was though, because you're right. Like um, all right, I'm not gonna have to run that back. Yeah, can we talk about that? <laughs> well, hold on, let, let, let Kogan finish his sentence, but we uh, are going to have to run that story back. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, nah, you can run with that right now. I was just going to say, I know why it's cool, because, like, between Alex, Paul, and his other workers, Nick, like, um, like they, they let each other have their voice. And even with the actors, like, everybody had their, their voice. So, like, they those guys do a great job of listening, but then, like, executing the vision with the input they're given. So it was dope. Hell yeah. Well said. Want- high high praise. Now, why did yeah. gun? Uh, why were guns drawn? <laughs> so, during uh, Honky Holocaust, we had the cops called on us three times, I believe. Like multiple times. <laughs> yeah, three times. One was one we were shooting uh, a fight scene uh, by El Pond in Melrose, uh, and they the cop a cop someone told the cops we were spraying graffiti. Which we weren't, um, and so they came, and, and I, I told the cop, I said, yeah, you don't, you know, we, we're allowed to be here uh, because we have less than the the limit of the number of people that you can have on a public film set. And I, I lied; we had way more than we were supposed to. But I knew, he, <laughs> <laughs> I knew he didn't know the law, so I was like, all right, well, I, this this dude, this dude has no idea what the film law is. Um, the next time we were, it was late at night, we were actually outside of the building that we were kind of using as a headquarters, and it was like four in the morning, and we were definitely being loud, and we weren't trying to be loud. It was just it was a scene we were shooting, so someone kept calling the cops because we kept waking them up, and I just pretty much said, "Listen, dude, we are so close to done," and they let us like t- do like two more takes. And that's all we needed. I remember uh, the, that. the third. Yeah, you were there, Colgan. Right, right, right. Oh yeah, that was good. The third time we had the cops called on us was the time they drew their guns. And, like, yo, I don't know if you know that, remember this, Colgan, but it was um, one or two days before uh, the Boston Marathon bombing. So, like, I always think, like, wow, if that had been like a week later, that might not have gone so well. <laughs> um, yeah, I think PTSD might have blocked that one out of my brain. Yeah, we were, <laughs> we were, um, we were shooting in Malden. Uh, at, at one of our uh, one of the cast members' houses, and the scene called for um, a bunch of you know a bunch of armed armed um, people who were going to go fight this Nazi dude, uh, the 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 head of the Manson family after Charles Manson died, and they were like getting ready for battle and like practicing and like you know loading their weapons and stuff, getting ready for war, and then they were marching out the door and down and like down an alleyway. It was a really quick transition shot, you know, that nothing happened in it except walking out the door uh, with with guns and then down an alleyway. And they were all fake guns. We spray painted <laughs> the ends to make them look real. Uh, well, listen, can I stop right there? One thing does happen. I'm pretty sure a guy pisses in his own mouth during yeah, that, that scene. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's it's that scene. It's that exact. Right. Scene. Um, we looked pretty that badass like, that day, though, going down yeah. the side of the house. You we certainly did. Pretty, you um, certainly did. We yes. did look pretty crazy. <laughs> uh, and uh, Colgan, you probably remember Mike McCarthy, the guy that pissed in his mouth. He was a professional wrestler, uh, <laughs> punk, uh, punk band uh, front man who I idolized in high school. Like he was like one of my favorite bands, um, and also a raging, raging alcoholic uh, at at a few points in his life. I think he's doing really well now, but at that point not so hot <laughs> and he was really really dr- we we had bought a whole bunch of 40 ounces um oh yeah that was like that was part of the, <laughs> the scene and we were like hey you know what guys we usually don't allow drinking on set because it it affects productivity but today have at it you know this is the scene and he i think he drank all of the 40 ounces that we bought for oh, everyone yeah <laughs> And then yeah. he proceeded to pee in his own mouth. <laughs> I don't think I've ever seen somebody piss that long. Like, you could have, like, had, like, the Guinness Book of World Records that day. Like, that was, like, insane. Hey, got that, all that, over Harry Tool. That was real? Yeah. yeah. Oh. Whoa. Yeah. <laughs> I need a minute. I mean, that's one of those things, like, I'm reliving it now. I'm like, damn, I really didn't want to see that, but you couldn't look away. It was like, what? Yeah. The- 
<laughs> the funny thing is, it like, wasn't not in the script. That was his idea. He was adamant that he wanted. Yeah, to he was. <laughs> <laughs> wow. I uh, know. So, wow. Memories. So as we were uh, in the alleyway shooting that that scene where he pees in his mouth at the top of the alleyway, which is right next to the house we were shooting in all day, I saw like a cop. And I'm like, oh, all right, the cops are here. We got to go explain to them that we're shooting a movie. It's okay. And then another cruiser, and like they had like three or four cruisers pull up, lights blaring, like guns drawn, ready for like a firefight. Because I mean, someone called the police and said, hey, I just saw like a bunch of like decked out people with shotguns, assault rifles, <laughs> pistols. <laughs> uh, yeah. Bat. Bat. yeah. <laughs> Yo, we were we were infiltrating. We were yes, coming like the exactly. SWAT team. <laughs> so and the cops came and and we just kept we were like trying to calm the cops down because they were definitely frantic. Um, yeah, yeah. And Kendra or uh, Maria Natapov, the actress playing Kendra Manson, um, did not understand that she could be shot and killed. <laughs> and she was holding the gun, her assault rifle in her hand, like. It's just a fake gun. It's, and I'm like, put it down. It doesn't matter. They don't care if it's fake or not. Um, they're they're so, not going to ask you if it's fake or not. Exactly, yeah. She, and she was, she's like, uh, she just kept saying, it's not real. It's not real. And I'm like, all it takes is one cop to not hear her and see her waving the gun and just to have a moment of like, oh, shit, and, and, and shoot her. And now I'm the director that had a cast member get shot on his <laughs> <laughs> but uh yeah luckily luckily that went that went better uh, i mean it went okay they ended up understanding that we were shooting a movie no one got shot and i think we got all the footage we needed that day <laughs> it's pretty awesome though because it is a badass scene because then they go to all out war at oh the mayor's yeah. office and uh yeah it's uh pretty badass it was scary though. Like literally, the next day or two days later was the marathon bombing, and yeah. I thought of that like a week or two later. I'm like, oh my god, if that had happened, no shit, dude. Oh, we all, we all could have gotten killed. You know what I mean? Oh yeah, yeah. At least at least pretty severely beaten. Yeah. <laughs> or or arrested and made examples of you know. Just, yeah. No shit. Yeah. So it looks like the film gods were smiling on us that yeah. day. So how, do, the how do you know when you're filming when when you are filming? Uh, how, I mean, how do people know that you're filming a scene? Um, do you like block off stuff and do like this kind of thing? Like, do you like block so, off the road or whatever, or block off the area, or like put a sign up that says "Hey, we're filming" or something? It, yeah, it depends. We actually have a uh, we have a like a banner that says uh, "Ungovernable Films Set," um, but it's more for like marketing and promotion than it is for like warning people a lot of times uh if we're in like an open set like a public set uh first of all we try not to be because there there is a sh the chance of getting shut down and that's like the worst thing ever like when you're shooting a scene and you're halfway done and then you have to scrap the whole thing because you get shut down halfway through yep. um and then you have to reshoot all the stuff you already shot because unless you're going to get a location that looks the exact same nothing's going to match up in post um, so a lot of times if we are shooting somewhere kind of public, we'll have people stationed, uh, like, um, almost like security and just to kind of tell people, Hey, just so you know, we are shooting a movie and most people are really cool about it. Like most people are like, Oh, can I, can I watch or something like that? I remember. So in, in the ungovernable forest, there's a, there's a scene where the, uh, the punks go to a hipster party and, and, and get in a big fight. And half of the fight happens indoors. The other half happens outdoors. So the outdoor part we shot in Brockton. And let me tell you, nobody gives a shit what happens in Brockton. <laughs> and so and I, live in Bro <laughs> I live in Brockton, so I can say that. So we were shooting out on the, par uh, out on the, on the sidewalk. We had a, ca a car with a blue light on it that was a cop car. Um, and this wild fight going on. And the only interference we had from the public was that the neighbors all pulled out lawn chairs and beers and watched? Like, it was like a show to them. <laughs> they were there in the way. Yeah, but but I mean, they but they were really cool. They were like, they let we let them know when we had, when they had to move because we were shooting in their direction, and they were just like cheering on the fight and stuff. It was really funny. Um, but yeah, for the most part, I mean, we just kind of set people up to like 
stand guard or you know uh, if the cops are coming they you know they'll tell us if there's people coming they'll yell and or hold people back and say hey do you mind just waiting a second before you walk as that we're filming right now most people are really cool about it mm -hmm. um that's just nuts it's, i mean the life of a filmmaker right you know yeah you, you don't get that it. as the life of a poet uh you, you know, that's not a very uh my life is definitely not as interesting as yours. <laughs> <laughs> not, I mean, not, hey, not, don't, not, don't forget, man. It's it's like so uh, we, we now we now shoot films uh, over the course of two weeks. Like that's our thing. Like we, I yeah. take two weeks off from work. We shoot almost every day for fourteen days straight. Get out everything we need, and then I'm not out shooting again for almost two years. Usually, you know what I mean. Yeah. So like, and my life might be kind of wacky for like two weeks and then i'm back to like hunched over my computer editing that footage for a year and a half or two years you're doing the post-production yeah yeah exactly yeah and that's actually my, my least favorite part is uh the production the filming the post-production is your favorite stuff post and and the writing part and the post-production are my favorite so what's what's more uh, i know we, we got to go to break but um what's okay. more important uh the what's more fun for you the writing or the post-production Uh, oh, we're not at break yet. I mean, I, I'll tell you when we're at break. Uh, I, uh, what's more important, uh, the writing or the post production? I have no idea. Uh, I, I think it depends on the movie. I really do. I think probably post production eventually becomes more fun because I get to see everything come together. But as a writer, like I, I just love writing and I like creating my own universe. You know what I mean? Oh my God, my poem is my poem at the end of this uh, whole podcast is about that. It's uh, nice. We'll we'll, we'll 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 talk about it, but um, that's nice. really great. Um, when you when you we're going to, we're going to a quick break, but um, when uh when you are writing, um, are you writing a screenplay or are you writing a story first? Or are you writing? How's that work for you? Because I'm always interested how a writer actually works, uh, and formulates their uh, you know the main the the screenplay. <laughs> So I'll give you an example. So I just finished writing uh, a script that we're going to shoot this summer, um, and and it it uh, for about a year, uh, six six months to a year, I would just text text myself um, ideas all the time, all the time, mm -hmm. uh, and then eventually, and I, when I when I get home, I put them all into a word document. So I eventually had like a fifteen to twenty page document of notes and then when i when I, I don't rush it but i one day randomly i will eventually feel the inspiration and the motivation to write it and that happened about a month ago and i wrote the script uh and i had all those notes handy so that's how i do it i, I spent a year or so of, of just writing down ideas and then when the time is right and i won't know i won't know when that is until it happens i sit down and i, I can write a, a feature length screenplay in like three days that's uh, this one, wow! Yeah, that that's how long it took me to write Honky Holocaust, and most of the Ungovernable Force I wrote in like a, a few days. Um, yeah, you're, you're on the uh, Neil Brennan and Dave Chappelle um, kick. <laughs> that's yeah, like right. Three days for half baked, right? <laughs> Keep that up, homie. That's dope. <laughs> this one took me like um about two months because I was actually editing uh, a documentary at the same time. Uh, that's pretty early. Or we're, we're gonna go to break, but at, when we get back, I want to see. I want to talk to you about like if you went to film school or whatever like that. But, cool. Uh, well, let's uh, let's uh, take a minute to uh, 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 talk yeah. about what's going on at uh, Oddball Magazine and JP Nine Productions. Sounds uh, good. All right, cool. Um, so normally we have like this cool sound effect that we haven't been able to have in a little while. Uh, oh. it goes, like we, we had to fire. We had, we had to make. Some some uh, downgrades. We had to fire our sound effects guy. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> yeah. yeah. So he was anyway, drinking we on the job. He was so stealing. I was, I was actually listening to something. <laughs> Always sunny in Philadelphia. I actually had that breaking news. Um, uh, the the breaking news thing that we use uh, was actually there. So maybe they got it from our show. Probably not. But um, yeah. So breaking news. Uh, this is what's going on at the magazine and JP Line Productions. Uh, Paul, why don't you tell me what's going on at JP Line Productions? You want to go first? No problem. 
Um, so over at JP Line Productions, we are uh, your role with the Crunchy Hip Hop Center. You can find us at jplineproductions.com. That's the home of uh, JPL Magazine and the home of uh, all things Lime, including our music. Uh, you can find links to our music video for what you need. Um, you can find uh, uh, some live show footage, and you can find uh, anything else about who JP Lime is and what our mission is here in the world. For JPL Magazine, recently we've uh, re reinvigorated ourselves in 2018, started to reconnect with some of our contributors, and um, this week we put out an article about uh, Black Panther. Uh, I, I love Marvel movies and I try to see them uh, opening weekend, and obviously Black Panther is huge, on track to be one of the biggest making movies ever. Uh, mm. I think it was on track for like $400 million after two weekends. Um, uh so we did a little piece about that we you know i talked about some of the things that i liked a lot about but I, we also tried to point your attention to some great writers who are already doing you know already talking in depth about um the direction the costume design and the, and the story of black panther so we wanted to point your attention towards um some good african-american journalists for that matter uh so that's our article on black panther that went up this week so definitely check that out um we'll be coming back soon with our good friend lsp who is a boston-based hip-hop producer um responsible for all of blue star boulevard and he does a little piece called lsp throwback thursday where he gives you he dials back through his digital volumes and finds a a beat for you to enjoy on your thursday um so we'll be starting that back up soon we also have um our hip hop group, Tyler Durden, which is a duo comprised of myself and uh, a guy named D Plus. We have a show coming up on March 18th, so we'll be doing some um, promo for that with uh, videos and some other information about us before that show in, what is that, like two and a half weeks? Um, and then the big thing that I wanted to, to finish up on is our good friend uh, Colgan here has a new enterprise called 1981 and Co. Um, which I'll let him talk about in just a second, but we've been uh, pushing that a little bit at the site, and you're going to be able to find very soon at jp9productions.com how you can purchase prints and um, and other stuff from 1981 and co. Space, you want to talk about that just a little bit? Uh, surely. Thank you. Um, yeah, man. Uh, JPL has always been um, wonderful and like the, I guess, the brainchild for so many things. Um, but 1981 and co, there's just so much beauty in the world. And I found that I wasn't able to get all that out in just words. Um, I've always loved photography and videos, and so um, I picked it up again. Um, so yeah, um, anybody listening, if you want to take some dope photos, really just get at me. I'm trying to take stunning like images, and I'm trying to make great art. And eventually, I want to stitch it all together. So Paul, if you eventually want to do like some moving images, you want some photos, music, like let's get some exhibition gallery stuff type going. I'm trying to make Boston pop. Hell yeah. Um, like the website will be up soon, and dude, if you want music, like let me know if you want that. Like this collaboration right now, like you guys are all amazing. So thank you for the time up here, and I'm really just trying to make dope, dope images and get out there. Um, I don't want to make public art. I just want folks to feel good. It's the same vibe, whether right. music, art, or photos. But yeah, this photo thing, I just want to show the joy I feel and give it back to people. That's all. Yeah. So, so definitely check that out at jpdimeproductions.com uh, and just search for 1981 and Co. It's up on the homepage right now, but you know if it comes to be a day or two and it's on the homepage, just search for it in the search bar and go follow Colgan at 1981 and Co. on Instagram, where you can uh, liven up your own Instagram feed with some great images of Boston and whatever else his camera happens to fall upon. Uh, yeah, you know, if I could sign in one sec, because I actually got to dip out. I got to edit some photos because I'm trying to submit something for another project. Um, I think yeah, all right you guys on. are Thanks amazing. So everybody listening, please check Jason, Prof, Paul. Um, please go watch Honky Holocaust. Watch all of Paul's films. Read all of Jason's poems. Prof, you know, I think you're the man. If I could work with any of you guys again, that'd be dope. And uh, just let me know. Thanks, man. Really appreciate it. Thanks for being on the show again, dude. Oh, yeah. Thank you for having me, man. Absolutely. Good to talk to you, Colgan. Always, man. Take care, buddy. Hey, th thank you. Thanks, brother. We'll check you soon. Yes, sir. Thanks, brother. So that is what's going on at, uh, at JPL Magazine and jplineproductions.com. Please come find us and follow us on Twitter and Facebook at jplime, at, at Instagram too, for that matter. Jason? Uh, so Oddball Magazine. Um, uh, some things have been going on with me and Oddball Magazine. Um, first of all, um, I just got accepted into uh, This Is My Brave. Um, 
I'm going to be uh, part of an awesome Boston cast. Um, it's in May. Uh, we're going to be talking about uh, mental health and recovery through poetry and, and uh, true stories. Can't wait. Um, I'm reading a poem that I, I wrote a couple days ago. They loved it. Um, so I'm going to be uh, in the cast of This Is My Brave. So um, it's a really great cause. Uh, this Is My Brave has a great YouTube channel of all these wonderful recovery stories of people with mental health challenges. Um, uh, not even challenges. It's it's not it's not a challenge anymore. People can beat mental health, and that's what this this is. Uh, that's what this. Um, that's what this is. My brave is about. It's a really great, um, great thing that I, I'm so blessed to be a part of. So that's going to be happening uh, soon. Uh, so check that out. This is my brave. Um, I'll be um, performing live uh, along with some wonderful people uh, who are going to be telling their story. A really great night of recovery. Um, so yeah, uh, so Oddball Magazine is oddballmagazine.com. Uh, we are a poetry and art uh, and entertainment um, uh, website. Um, we like to put interesting things on the internet. Um, uh, not, <laughs> not completely mental health related, but um, I don't think everyone in, in on our um, on our on our show is. I mean on our. Uh, on our website it has some kind of mental health issue, but most of the, most of the, the people that I, that are dear to me uh, do. Uh, <laughs> so, <laughs> like our graphic, that, that our, chicken to the egg. <laughs> yeah, like uh, like our um, like our uh, yeah, exactly, but Paul, like the you know, like our 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 columnists. Um, not all of them are totally open with their mental health condition, but I mean, a lot of people do have it. Um, so. I'm pretty open with it, you know. If you are about oddball, we talk very much about, uh, you know, we are poets who had, have had mental illness. Um, people who see things beautiful through broken lenses. People who wash, wash your dishes, you know, that kind of thing. So um, we're Oddball Magazine. Um, so I'll just tell you what we did uh, today and yesterday because we have a lot of content. So we have uh, uh, the Epic Autism Review with Fleming's Bobrin. Uh, Flemings is a great guy. We want to have him on the podcast. I met him uh, uh, a while back. Um, he has these great, uh, um, just great. I love his columns. This one's a uh, knee jerk reactions to Black Panther. Uh, 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 he he loves the movie and uh, it's uh, it's great. Um, and it's a great little read. The the epic autism review near knee jerk reactions to Black Panther. Um, then I wrote my poem, uh, Advice for a Young Poet, today. Uh, actually, yesterday, uh, after getting off the phone with Prof, um, I wrote my poem for today. Uh, it's called Advice for a Young Poet. Um, it talks about uh, writing with balls. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. Uh, that takes some dexterity. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> writing with your balls. Uh, and then we have um, the return of uh, Junkman Radio. Um, but uh, it's different. It's feedback with Lizzie Von Teague. Um, she, uh, she has come back uh, with uh, some great. Um, we're what we're great to have her back. Uh, she's she has these great uh, takes on music, and she reviews Sleepwalkers by Brian Fallon, which is uh, she's really into uh, like uh, like folk punk, and uh, she, uh, we love having Lizzie on 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 um, on our on our list of oddballs. Then uh, we have. Someone I've never met before, but his name is Bill Harvey. He's uh, from Detroit. He's a comic strip artist. Uh, he's been with us for about two years now. Uh, thanks, Bill. Uh, the Odds is a great, great, uh, great uh, comic strip. We love having you every Monday. Uh, it's fantastic that you want to be a part of us. Thanks. Uh, then we have Janet Cormier, a Somerville poet and activist. Uh, she has a, her bamboozled no more. She does it every every Thursday, and also Wise Words with Bruce Wise, which is probably my favorite acquisition in the last year or so. Uh, Bruce is really one of the most uh, prolific poets I've ever met. He takes uh, he takes basically uh, uh, you know current events, history, politics, and he writes about six or seven poems in 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 the uh, in his column, all with different names, uh, all just monikers of his uh, name. Bruce Wise, uh, Bruce is amazing, and then of course we have Liza Zayas. Uh, she's a gem. Uh, she uh, she's been with us in the underground garden. I need to contact her. She's such a wonderful person. I um I need to see how she's doing. And then um, James Van Loy and it's all one thing. And those are just our columnists. Uh, 
Plus, we we had a poem by Kiriti Sengupta. He's been with us for a while now with artwork by Ira Joel Haber. A poem by Hannah Packman with uh, our friend, Dr. Regina Beluzzi. Glenn Bow is back with some photography and a poem by Martha Clarkson. And uh, that's what's going on at, um, at Oddball Magazine this week. So, um, yeah. Damn, that's a lot of poetry. I know, dude. It's so much content. I know. It's crazy. But we were really great to do this. And Chad Prento uh, from uh, Stone Sioux Poetry and uh, the driving force behind Oddball Magazine. He is an amazing, hardworking person, and uh, we love having him on the show, uh, on the uh, on the, the website. He we couldn't do it without him. He's the best. So uh, that's what's going on at Oddball Magazine. Um, so yeah, check us out. Um, we are an awesome magazine. JP Lime is an awesome magazine, and. Oddball Show is an awesome podcast, so come and write us a review. Uh, you can find us on iTunes and Stitcher. Please write us a review. Tell us what you think about our show. We would love to hear from you. Uh, now, uh, that was a really long Hi. break. Let's go back to Paul. He's the most interesting person here, so let's go. <laughs> I don't know. Oh, yeah, that's that. right. Paul's here. I forgot about that. <laughs> yeah, right? <laughs> thanks hey, thanks for sticking around, Paul. <laughs> thanks, Paul. Oh, I'm hey, still here. I, I had no idea. <laughs> um... <laughs> Like I said, in the second half, we want to talk a little bit about uh, Jason and Paul's connection with the Melton Health Field. But I want to ask one real quick question. We meant, you mentioned James Gunn before. It's a two-part question that should be quick. Do you enjoy Marvel movies? And which who is your favorite director? Is it James Gunn? So um, I'm not really, honestly, I mean, you, got, you I might be banned from the show after saying this. I'm not really big on superhero movies in general. Uh, it's okay. I, I, I'm the only superhero nerd here. It's okay. You will oh, okay, be banned. Cool. Star Wars movie. <laughs> <laughs> What's that? Like Star Wars? Oh, I love Star Wars. Yeah, like Star Wars. I actually I like Star Trek uh, even more. Mm. I'm a huge yeah. Trekkie. But anyway, okay. um, are you talking about favorite director or favorite Marvel director? Well, I meant I meant favorite Marvel director. I also then was going to ask about favorite director, but that's an even bigger question. Okay. I, the only thing I've ever seen by James Gunn is uh tromeo and juliet and i think he wrote part of terra firma or something like that so i've actually never seen guardians of the galaxy i've seen clips i've, I've really only just seen the clip that lloyd kaufman is in um it's one of the best uh, I, wait what wait where is, where is he in in guardians do you know do you know what he does uh i asked you that even I though you just said you've never seen the movie the scene, but I, I have no idea what's going on yeah, in it. it's yeah. like he's He's an extra, but and he's doing. He's kind of prominent. Like the camera's panning across the scene, and he's doing something. Uh, I want to say he's in a bar or something, or a club or something. But I could be wrong about that. No, it probably is. There's a. Well, no, we won't get into it. It's, yeah. It is one of the best uh, movies in the Marvel set. He just gun really does an awesome job. It is cool. just phenomenal looking. Uh, but yeah. I like Marvel movies. Yeah, I, I like Star Wars movies. I think, um, I think uh, these. I mean, but I can see why you like Star Trek. I can definitely see it because I love Star Trek. It's kind of such a deep yeah. universe, you know. Yeah, yeah. My, my wife and I are obsessed with Star Trek. It's kind of campy. Am I wrong? It's Star Trek. Oh, it's campy. wicked campy. Yeah, yeah. Especially, especially the old, the uh, original series. Yeah, I mean, Star Wars kind of took themselves like. I mean, I mean, the filmmaking in the original Star Wars is amazing, but I mean, right. Well, seriously, where Star Trek, like you know, William Shatner and stuff, come on, like, that's oh, yeah, that's like Batman stuff, like back in the day, you know what I mean? Like, yep, exactly, you know, and I, I can see why you would like that, and I can see the connection between that and um, you know, exploitation films. And Star Trek is definitely exploitation stuff compared to Star Wars, and oh, like, totally, you know yeah, I mean? Star Wars is more uh, epic, it's epic, it's yeah. an epic, whereas Star Trek is, is a lot more uh. I don't mean this in a bad way. It just is what it is. It's very more. It's much more one-dimensional. Where uh, there's not a lot of like deep, deep story going on. I mean, as as, as you go further into the, the later series, there there's more and more. But Star Wars has like a rich, rich uh, myth mythology and everything. Where Star Trek only goes back as far as like the 20th century. Have you ever read Star Wars, The Philosophy of Star Wars? It'll blow your doors off if you've ever read it. it is I haven't, no. Fantastic. You know what? I'll see you, um, and I'll bring it to you. All right, cool. I'll let you borrow it. Um, and I guess that's a little uh, – I guess we can talk about um, – I met Paul at uh, uh, a place called the Positive Mirror House, which is a, 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 it's a, um, a, a mental health clubhouse that he uh, uh, is a manager of or something, right? Like. I'm a 
Like, so I'm, I'm an employment coordinator. Um, okay. Yeah. It's we're, we're all gen- at clubhouses. We're all, we all, we're all considered generalists. Yeah. Um, but I, 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 I handle some employment stuff, which is the only, which is the only department in a clubhouse that sets you apart a little bit, just a tiny bit from the other staff. Absolutely. Um, yeah. yeah other than that, I, I just kind of do what everyone else does. And um, I, I met, okay, Paul, I don't know if you know this, but, when I first started working as a peer specialist, I got I went to the Naposa River House site because I'd never been there. Yeah, and I picked out all your videos that you had uh, filmed with the people from uh, Naposa River House. Oh, on on our YouTube our YouTube channel. Yeah, dude. And I thought, oh my god, I totally want to get involved with this because uh, I don't. I mean, I, I want to learn how to to do this stuff, um, but I want to be like kind of part of that message, uh, which. Yeah. You made actually a Star Wars movie where you talked about stigma busting, and uh, that was the first time I had ever seen you. I didn't know who you were, and when I met you, I was kind of like, "That's the guy from the YouTube videos." Uh, <laughs> and Nigma, I, 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 I'm talking. Uh, I'm walking with. I, I don't know. I ran into you, and I was like, "Do you have a Toxic Avenger tattoo on you?" And uh, find out that you are a wealth of uh, amazingness about trauma, which that's crazy. But. Um, Going back to that original idea, like you made these videos for mental health awareness, um, like stigma busting and the three rooms yeah. or whatever. Um, I, I mean, I think that's that's great. It's awesome. It, I, I, yeah, and they're a lot of fun. And you know what's really weird is, uh, um, I, I'm in, I'm in a very I'm, I'm in a very precarious position there uh, because uh, I, I don't know how much you know or. You too, Prof, or anyone in the world knows about uh, the clubhouse philosophy, but it's a very, it's a very incredible, um, brilliant philosophy that is possibly the most fragile, barely sustainable uh, system ever conceived by mankind. Um, it, it, it needs constant, constant, um, what's it called, monitoring. Yeah. Uh, because if if anything is off by a tiny bit, the entire system collapses, and yet it's complete and utter chaos every day. Um, but uh, long story short, the whole idea of a clubhouse is that, and I know you know this, uh, um, Jason. But yeah. for anyone else out there that, that doesn't know what a mental health clubhouse is, the staff are are intentionally small um, so that they they can't get all the work done. And therefore, they they need to rely on the members to help them with the work, and therefore, it creates a a natural um, com- camaraderie among the members and staff, uh, which is then further reinforced by these thirty seven standards that um, insist, uh, and rightfully so, that the members and staff are considered to be equals, uh, that nothing is done by the staff alone, um, that the members do everything. That in the clubhouse that needs to get done with with the staff involvement, but nothing is done by just the staff, et cetera. I mean, there's 37 of these very well thought out and constantly changing standards. So it's a very, very intricate system. And again, it's it's amazing, mm. but it does it needs constant uh, monitoring. And because of that, um, the clubhouses are always changing. They're always trying new things to try and a keep fresh. Because if a clubhouse goes stagnant. Eventually, you're going to have people stop wanting to be involved in the work of the day, and the staff will take on more and more responsibility because they don't care about the philosophy anymore, and then you no longer have a clubhouse. Uh, yes. So therefore, everything's changing constantly, uh, and, and part of the change was they wanted to create a new position about three and a half years ago at Naponza River House that did um, employment and uh, media stuff, and so they hired me to do that. Um, now here's the here's the part that that drives me it keeps me up at night sometimes is that uh, a a clubhouse at, at its core is obsessed with employment obsessed with employment and and and, it, and that's a good thing because uh, the philosophy is all based on the idea that human beings especially those suffering from mental illness uh, will only um, you know, improve, feel better, uh, reach self-actualization, um, whatever you want to call it, by being worthy, by feeling purposeful, and therefore they have to do some kind of work in the world. 
the clubhouse has tons of work that needs to get done. So a lot of people show up at the clubhouse. All of a sudden, they went from 30 years of laying in bed, you know, depressed or, or hallucinating or totally, you know, zonked out on met on, on way too many meds. Mm -hmm. uh, and now they're actually helping cook a lunch or driving someone to work or doing computer work or even just cleaning a bathroom. I mean, and that's what the beauty of Clubhouse is. And then there's absolutely a camaraderie there. There's absolutely. Oh, absolutely. Great. Absolutely. It's great to see. I love going to NRH. I love seeing everyone there. Um, I love getting lunch with and, uh, you know, Trudy is a wonderful person. Um, yeah. I just, I really like the, uh, the way you guys do it. You guys do a good job. And uh, yeah. I can tell the people who are there are empowered. Yes, absolutely. Um, and, and, be, and because I was hired to do employment and media, and because clubhouses are so obsessed with employment, it, 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 at times it feels like if I do media stuff, it's taking away from the clubhouse. And I know that's not true, but there's, a, there's very little built into a clubhouse that is supportive of, of what we do in the media room. There's nothing that's opposed to it, but like where every fiber of the clubhouse is being is about employment. I'm like, all right, I should be working on employment. I should work. And so like me, I'm a very, which one, I don't know which left brain or right brain, whichever one is more analytical and uh, uh, rigid. That's me. I am as, as, as artistic as I am. I am super neurotic and, and analytical and everything. Um, and therefore it, it, I feel like if I'm not doing what needs to be done for the good of the clubhouse, uh, at its core, then what am I, what, that I shouldn't be doing anything. And therefore I, whenever I'm in the media room as much fun as I'm having, I'm like, all right, is this really helping the clubhouse? And then, you know, when I really look back on it and I see what people and other clubhouses are doing and I see the work that we do in the media room, I'm reminded, well, yeah, this is incredible work. This is really meaningful and it's a whole new realm of of skills that people would never get from working cleaning a bathroom or yeah. working in the kitchen is as important as those things are this is a whole different thing uh, uh, i mean i uh, could i would love to learn all that i mean i want to just come and take classes there uh, you know honestly to learn um how to do do final pro and stuff the fact that you offer that stuff at the at nrh is freaking oh well, i don't know do you offer final pro or whatever or? we have final cut there yeah we don't yeah, i don't, don't know what it's called that's the cheese yeah and, and 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 Jason, you're always welcome, especially if you bring um, young adults. <laughs> well, I, there's a bunch of people that I mean, we can't really name them, you know, for whatever. But I I could bring a lot of people. Awesome, you know, uh, who are I mean, there's people that I work with, uh, Paul, who are brilliant writers, who are artists, who are poets, who are musicians, and all they have is a stupid friggin' diagnosis that brings them down. Yep, I hear you. You know what I mean? I and like, that's not what mental health is. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, like, the fact that you – the thing that brought me to to um, want to go to NRH was the fact that you have a media room. That's so cool. Yeah. You know? Like, I think that – I mean, cleaning toilets is nice, but, like, learning how to, <laughs> like, do Final Pro, uh, Final Cut is way more more impactful for some I hear you. I, I, I totally agree. And I can think of someone right off the top of my head who would totally benefit from it. Excellent. Um, absolutely. Um, so uh, I mean, I, I, I mean, keep doing that. Keep, keep you know, I want to, I want to, I'd love to see some more stuff from from uh, you know that that YouTube channel, and it, I'd love to help you. I mean, definitely. I, the more the merrier. We, we have that. That is probably one of the most difficult meetings to keep going because, uh, you know, it, again, it, the, the 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 course of the day is so frantic. That to sit down for an hour and a half and you know plan out a video and do this and if you we, we close the door because if you open that door you get caught up in the whirlwind again yeah um, so yeah it, 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 that that the media room is uh the media meeting is is fantastic uh, and and it needs a constant influx of new people and uh, attention and I will I I will uh, you know we'll talk I would love to just uh, be part of it so well, you know awesome cool um. So that's what I mean. That's how me and um, me and Paul kind of met. Um, I saw his YouTube videos and uh, did not know that he was, a, um, you know, a trauma <laughs> film director. It's funny how you meet people, uh, and that's kind of the journey. Um, I think, um, totally. You know, well, it sounds like really powerful stuff. You know, uh, it's it's it, and it um it reminds me a lot of like last last couple shows that we've done on on mental health awareness. 
um, both of Rokas Lupic with the, uh, the living with the living museum. You yeah. know that, that that's kind of an interactive, uh, community based organization that seems to have less structure than the clubhouse. You know, yeah. and kind of thrives on that. And it, and it seems, reminds me a lot of you know I'm learning a lot as we do these mental health podcasts. You know, this is obviously more your area, but I'm I'm soaking up a lot. And it reminds me a lot of what we talked about with peer support. You know, and the reasons yeah. why that's important. You know, yeah, so um, because um, some people um, like the, the 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 peer gets it. I think I, I mean a good peer support specialist gets it. Um, you know what I mean? Um, I, I think that's like just the nature of peer support. Um, I, I think uh, the, the 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 nature of of uh, mental health work is to move people forward. Um, and you know, through Rokas doing what he so Paul, what Rokas does is really cool. Um, Rokas, what is Rokas? His name is Rokas Lupic, and he, you know him? No, I, I, I don't. Okay, so Rokas Lupic. <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah, he lives in the Netherlands, so I don't imagine that you do. <laughs> so, so we had Rokas Lupic on. We, we had to call him at like 10 in the morning on a Saturday because uh, <laughs> it was like 6 o'clock his time or something. Um, and we talked to him about his living museum. It's actually a art museum. You would love this. If you ever go to the Netherlands or even Brooklyn, um, because there's one in Brooklyn. Was it in Brooklyn, um, Prof? Oh, it's in Harlem. Harlem. Really? Living yep. Museum, dude. They, they are these um, uh, mental health, uh, uh, I don't know, they're like, they're um, p- people with mental health conditions. Okay, so they used to be psych wards, but now they're art museums, and they're, and they're run by the people, they're run by the, the artists get paid and they all have mental health conditions, and they put wow. together this amazing art, and uh, it's so empowering for people. Uh, wow! Yeah, it's so cool. So I met him at the Alternatives Conference, and I had to have him on the show. It was it was amazing. Of course, yeah, that's amazing. Yeah. But it reminds me a little bit of that, you know, an alter- alternative kind of um, idea, or at least a progressive type of idea for how to work with uh, mental health awareness. Uh, and Rokas is is devout about it that he thinks that is a very beneficial model uh yeah you know, for the people that he's worked with and and, la- and last week we had thomas brown on who's like uh, a amazing advocate for peer peer support work uh doing some great work uh with bay Cove and um the I- eastern mass peer network and uh i don't know the uh, the, the 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 world of mental health is expanding and it's, it's totally a good thing you know it's like People are getting better. People are improving. I know I've improved. I, I was in 2016. I was in a psych ward, and I found out about NAMI. Uh, and, you know, and I found out about in our own voice. And I was like, this exists. Like you get, you go to schools and colleges, and you talk to people about your experiences to change how people look at things. Right. Working amazing. Yeah. Um, so I don't know. There's, I don't know. There's a lot of good work out there. And um, absolutely. And, and it's barely been tapped into by most people. Absolutely, and I think I think one of the things about mental health is people don't get it. Right. Um, people people don't get it. They don't understand um, that it's possible to recover from it. People think uh, that it's just like you're going to constantly suffer. Uh, you don't suffer with it. You end up living with it. And you yep. End up living with it. Um, and one of the people I always think of um, is you know I always think of Princess Leia. You know. Yeah. Princess Leia. You know. Um, because she had, you know, bipolar disorder, or you know, freaking uh, the Harvard professor from um, *The Beautiful Mind*, or John you know, Nash, yeah, or even K. Redfield Jameson, who you know is like the, uh, you know, unquiet mind and stuff. So I don't know. It's just, yeah. it's just amazing. Uh, one thing about having it is the brilliance that comes with it. I think, and I think that's like a wonderful thing. You know, absolutely, yeah, yeah. Um, well, I'm going to step off my soapbox. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, we're winding down the end of the hour. Actually, we're, we're, we're over the hour, but we're having a good time. So um, you want to do a list of 10, uh, Prof? Yeah, man. As as happens when you're having a good time here at the Oddball Show, it zip, just zips have, right by us. I wish so. we could have more time with Paul. Cause, well, uh, we can. He, I think uh, you know we could definitely have him come back and talk more. We have, we've only touched the surface of ungovernable films. We only mentioned Hockey Holocaust. So well, it's been a great time. We really would yeah. appreciate it if you want to come back and uh, talk about anything you got upcoming or, and, or just d- dive right back into um, the very deep world of exploitation films. Anytime, man. I just, I, it's, 
I love talking about this stuff. Uh, I love talking about mental health. I love talking about me. So <laughs> <laughs> we all get that in common. I'm pretty sure. <laughs> so, yeah, you name the time and, and, and date, and I'll be there. All right, man. There Excellent. You Thank you. Yep. So, cool. yes, we are The Oddball Show. Please come check us out on iTunes and Stitcher and um, write us a review. Uh, that would be very helpful towards our um, getting some feedback on what we think about here at the podcast. We're having a great time. We'd like to know that you are as well. well. Yeah, we'd love to know if like anyone's even listening to us. <laughs> <laughs> they are, Jason. They are. Yeah. <laughs> um, the Oddball Show runs Big live. <laughs> what did you say? Big brother is watching. <laughs> That's not who we want watching. We want <laughs> little brother. We want lots yeah, of little brothers. Right. Yeah, yeah. All right. Go ahead. Uh, the Oddball Show runs live at Oddball Magazine and jplanproductions.com. You can find us on iTunes and Stitcher and um, wherever good podcasts are run. Uh, it is a collaboration between jplanproductions.com and Oddball Magazine. Please come check us out at those our respective websites. Um, and our thanks very much to Paul for being here this evening. We're going to close out with, uh, as we often do with a jagged thought in just a minute from Mr. Jason, Wright. But before we do, Paul, are you ready for, even though you don't know what's coming, the list of 10. The yeah. list of 10. <laughs> very well done. Very well done. The, li the list of 10 is a set of 10 questions based on, um, so our, Roughly based on James Lipton's questionnaire from Inside the Actor Studio, which is also based on a French show, which is based on the Proust questionnaire. It goes a long way back. It's a deep tradition. Okay. Uh, so here we are. Let's start this off. Question number one for Paul on the list of ten. The list of ten. <laughs> <laughs> right. Number one. What time and place would you like to be if not here and now? Tomorrow. Nice. <laughs> Number two. Uh, what is the greatest advice you've ever received? I have no idea. Uh, wow, I feel like if it was any other time, I could probably think of it. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I don't know. Pressure, I mean, uh, I just don't take myself too seriously, I guess. I have no clue. All right. That'll work. <laughs> there you go. But yes, the pressure is serious during the list of 10. I understand. Oh, my God. It's overwhelming. <laughs> <laughs> Number three, what would your superpower be? Oh, uh, probably flying. Yep, that's mine right. too, man. People have said flying on the show. Everyone wants to fly. It's, yeah, I, it, I, it really I is like the best fly. power. It really is. I would love to fly. Just yeah. You know, as a person, not in a plane, not in a hang ladder, just out and go. Oh, yeah. That'd be great. Oh, cool. Yep. Or swim a lot. You can do that. What would you say? Or swim a lot? <laughs> swim a lot. Okay. <laughs> yeah, you, 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 could be, you could be Aquaman, or you could fly through the air. That would be awesome. <laughs> <laughs> you choose. I can talk to fish, or, you know, fly yeah, like a bird. Fly. You can get shark to me and start swimming. Just saying. It's dangerous. At least you can fly away from stuff. You can see stuff coming. You know, if you're swimming, you're just gonna get eaten by a big sperm whale or something. That's true. That is true. Sperm whales are the biggest whales, I believe. I'll, I'll take your word for it. Just yeah, be yeah. careful when swimming, everybody. Okay. <laughs> Number four. Don't eat before uh, thirty minutes beforehand. Don't don't eat more than two <laughs> hours before being eaten by a whale. Actually, that's that's my. Uh, I take it back. <laughs> <laughs> I want, uh, my superpower is I can eat and then swim immediately after. <laughs> I thought that was going to be your advice. <laughs> That's what I thought too. I thought it was oh. be, don't swim before you eat by a whale. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, excellent. Excellent. <laughs> Number four uh, Biggie or Tupac? Um, I go with Biggie. All right, he's got rhymes. He's got bars. I I like I love Tupac, but Biggie hands down. There we go. He, he, led, he led the life, and he had bars. Yeah, he really did. Mm. Number five, who is your favorite person? Favorite person? Uh, like that I know, or famous, or history, or what? However, <laughs> however that works for you. However, yeah, however it works for you. My wife. Oh, 
She'll listen to this, so I have to say that. I was going to say that's almost always the right answer. Whoever <laughs> <laughs> says they're mailman. But what would you do if you didn't mailman. have uh, I don't even know my mailman. Uh, I don't know my mailman either because he never gave me the headset back from the left. <laughs> He's listening in right now. <laughs> they're all like, crying a little bit. <laughs> Jason doesn't know my name. <laughs> <laughs> Number six, what is your quest? Um, to, uh, to, to live a full life before I die. You're doing it. Full life before you, you die. Yeah. Anyway. That's uh, much easier said than done. It really is. It really is. And it changes every day. If you're lucky. It's true. Number seven, fill in the blank. All you need is blank. Uh... Food, oxygen, food and oxygen. <laughs> I, I thought you were going to list like 20 things and that would have been awesome. No. <laughs> you, need, you need food, oxygen, sex, a walk every day, you need an apple, you need like, you know, probably a little bit of yogurt. All you need is gore. And I was like, that's <laughs> <laughs> all you need is gore. I'm thinking Maslow's hierarchy of needs right now. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> food, water, shelter. Exactly. <laughs> Number eight, rock, paper, or scissors? Scissors. Scissors. The underrated answer, I think. I go with paper because I'm a writer, so people go with rock because they rock. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> Number nine, what do you want to be when you grow up? Um, this, I mean, I... I don't know how much more growing up I can do. <laughs> Hopefully not. This. This. And, and number 10, uh, if heaven exists, what would you like to hear St. Peter say when you reach the pearly gates? Um, you took a wrong turn. <laughs> <laughs> well done. Paul, you have survived the list of 10. The list Thank you. Of 10. Wedding. <laughs> Um, all right, so we're going to close out the show with uh, Jason Wright's Jagged Thoughts, which is his weekly column. He does it all about magazine. But before we do, I would just very much like to say thank you to, uh, to Paul McLarney for being here. Please do check out, uh, go right now after um, the this, this show is over to ungovernablefilms.com where you can get links on um, uh, the movies are available through a variety of different formats. So you, you can get information on, on how to watch all the films and get involved with um, a very interesting and deep uh, genre and a very unique artist. So thank you very much. Thank you guys. Boundaries of, of, of boundaries. And, uh, and, um, and I, I, um, you know, the movies you do are, they're well done. They're well acted. Uh, they're cool. They're gory. Uh, there's a lot of, a lot of boobs, which I like. Um, <laughs> there's, a, there's a lot of cool stuff in there. There's a, there's no CGI yet. Um, uh, there's a lot Hopefully of ever, <laughs> or ever, because they're 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 fuck CGI. That's uh, right. It's just oh, like, and and you can hear JP Lime music in Honky Holocaust. You can. Holocaust. Hear, you can. You can. Music on Honky Holocaust. Uh, so you get it all. You get it all, really. Also, you if you're all. a fan of Boston movies, like I'm pretty sure I saw uh, in um, uh, Ungovernable Force, like uh, like '93, uh, The Holland Tunnel, and maybe um, the airport. We go to the airport in one scene. Which well, scene? The very beginning. The very beginning. You're dr- oh you're- man, we drove all over the. Oh yeah, yeah, the tunnel. The tunnel. You're right. You're right. Actually, what's that? Before you light the firecrackers at you because you're in the movie. Yeah. 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 You're. you're yeah, you're, yeah, you're right. That's East. That's East Boston. How did I? I'm surprised you recognize that. I don't know, man. I mean, uh, there's actually uh, this the, the movie The Equalizer, Denzel Washington. Yeah. There's a scene where he's walking up the street in East Boston, literally next to that building. No way. Yeah, I was like, oh my God, we literally shot like 100 feet from where he is right now. But, but we, were there, we were there first. At himself. That's what you did. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Uh, and if you know, if you see Ungovernable Force, you'll know what we're talking about and you'll say it's pretty awesome that uh, Paul's in it. Um, it's just a cool movie. I can't wait to watch the rest of it. Um, I'm going to watch Honky Holocaust. Although last time I tried to watch it, I think uh, my computer exploded. That happens sometimes. 
Um, but yeah, check out check out Paul's uh, uh, ungovernable films. Check out Trauma. Um, it's freaking incredible that that we know this guy, that Paul's Paul exists, that he does this stuff, and uh, it's awesome. Thanks, Paul, for being on the show. Thank you guys for having me. It's been real. Yeah, man, it's definitely been real. Um, uh, I'm gonna uh, close off the, the the night with my jagged thought of uh, of, the, of the week. Um, the Royvis T is uh, leaving my system, as it uh, tends to do. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, let's um. Let's Are you up. urinating yourself? Is that what you just told us? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I don't know how else it leaves your system. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's, a, that's a good point. I guess it's still in there. It's going strong. <laughs> you're not. You're not pissing in your own mouth. That's what I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> that's enough of, your, uh, of my personal life. Okay. All right. <laughs> it's metabolizing. Yeah. <laughs> okay, guys. It's been real fun having you on the show, Paul. Uh, please come. Thank on. you, um, Prof. I'm gonna uh, end off with a jagged thought. Two one thirteen advice for a young poet. Uh, come uh, um, come and write us a review on iTunes. Uh, we really want to hear from you and let you know if you're listening or not. Okay. Uh, jagged thought two one three advice for a young poet. Here we go. Breathe in. Write your thoughts down. All that bullshit in your head. Light it like a bomb and write your ass off till it explodes. This idea, writing, take that 1,000 word picture, creating something beautiful or as ugly as you want to. If only a minute, that one minute of writing, you matter. You're the creator. That for the moment that whatever plagues you, the tattoo tatted on your wrist and all that it is is ink, that feeling, let it dissolve into you. And for a moment, you are conqueror. Your digital identity, your forever tomb. Right till the clock stop. Finish like good sex or like something not ordinary, like this world, but something different. Tell them you are brilliant in a few sentences. Tell them, fuck you, I'm doing this. And in your writer's world, you are king, queen, prince, princess, martyr, superhero, savior, destroyer, president, emperor, governor, Schwarzenegger. You are the terminating gunslinger with this writing shit. And when you are done, then you can be ordinary. You can go back to being a shade of gray. But right now, don't stop. Make each line make you stronger than you are. Bigger than the projection on the movie screen. Be King Kong. Be Cleopatra. But each poem will end, poet. It will. You will recess back into your shell like a little tiny insignificance. But you know when you go back to that digital pad, you can build yourself another world again. Build, destroy, repeat. That's what we do. Write that poem's history. Write its constitutions. Write its symphonies, anthems, President's Days. Build its monuments and its mausoleums. Write its Big Bang Theory. Write its own place in the world's library. Then breathe out. That's my advice for you, young poet. And that was Jagged Thought 213, Advice for a Young Poet. And this has been the Oddball Show. Uh, thanks again, Paul, for being on the show. Um, it was a pleasure having you. Thank you guys. Um, yeah, absolutely. Uh, we're gonna we're gonna say good night now, and we'll be back in two weeks. Uh, Prof, who's our guest? Our guest is Mr. PSA, aka Lamar Harris, who is a um, uh, an icon of the Northern Boston music scene, part of uh, Rec Shop Movement with Justice Born. And as it turns out, in a very weird coincidence, having nothing at all to do with scheduling or purpose, uh, he is in Honky Holocaust. Oh, all right. <laughs> but yeah, uh, Mr. PSA will be on our, our next show. All right, guys. All right, thanks. It's been a pleasure, Paul. Thank you so much, and uh, we're out. We'll talk to you later. Later, guys. All right, see ya. Bye. Right. This is the Oddball Show, a podcasting collaboration for Creepy Live Productions and Oddball Magazine.